I'm overwhelmed. I'm incredibly happy. Um, I, I want to say thank you, Theresa May, because it was an incredibly brave decision to stand up to a, another nation as strong and powerful as America is rare. What about habeas corpus? Um, what about, you know, the presumption of innocence before guilty? What about the, right, um, the first duty of government to protect its own citizens? Tears of joy and tears of sorrow. Two very similar cases with two very different outcomes. For some time, Britain's extradition treaty with the US has been the source of controversy in the UK. Human rights groups and a number of politicians across the political spectrum have called for major changes that protect the rights of British citizens. It really comes down to the Extradition Act, which was of course brought in in the wake of 9-11 um, and, and rushed through. And in the process, a lot of the safeguards um, and the discretionary safeguards that we had in place for British judges deciding when an extradition order could be made, they were got rid of in that Act. And one of the key concerns we have about that is, is the, the different standards in terms of, of who is extradited and when. Um, so of course there's a higher standard for the UK requesting um, someone to be extradited from the US. And then of course in the UK the Extradition Act has done away with the prima facie requirement which is that a basic case is made out in a UK court before someone is, is extradited, parceled off across the world um, to face um, a foreign justice system. And now the British government has decided to block the extradition of one citizen, Gary McKinnon, who the US government wants to put on trial for what it describes as the biggest military computer hack of all time in 2002, which shut down the US military's Washington computer network and paralyzed munition supply deliveries to the US Navy's Pacific Fleet. After careful consideration of all of the relevant material, I have concluded that Mr. McKinnon's extradition would give rise to such a high risk of him ending his life that a decision to extradite would be incompatible with Mr. McKinnon's human rights. I have therefore withdrawn the expedition, extradition order against Mr. McKinnon. The UK Home Secretary took the decision on the basis of Gary McKinnon's diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome and depressive illness. But in sharp contrast, just two weeks earlier, she welcomed the extradition of another British citizen with the same diagnosis. Earlier this year, a psychiatrist warned that Talha Ahsan would face a high risk of suicide if extradited and placed in solitary confinement for a long period, as is expected. Can the Home Secretary say why, if she accepts that the law does need to change, why then she sanctioned the extraditions of Barbara Ahmed and Tala Arson? Surely they should also be benefiting from a fair extradition process. They were extradited on the 5th of October. They are still waiting for about a year at least before they're even going to come to trial. British citizens accused of, of committing crimes here in Britain, they should be tried in Britain, not in the US. I think it's the Royal Court, so what? The extradition of the would-be librarian Talha Ahsan and his co-defendant, computer expert Babar Ahmed, has aroused controversy in the UK, given that both men are accused of crimes allegedly committed in Britain. Prior to their extradition, they were held without charge or trial for six years in the case of Talha Ahsan and eight years in the case of Babar Ahmed, the longest term any British citizen has served without trial in the UK in modern history. The allegations against them centre around this website, azam.com, which was taken down in 2002. It contained articles on the conflicts in Chechnya and Bosnia and later Afghanistan. US prosecutors argue the site and the men acted as a recruitment and fundraising base for jihad, although the two deny this. As is the nature of the internet and websites, the data was spread across multiple servers all over the world, including here in the UK and various Asian nations. For a brief period of just a few months, one of those servers was based in Connecticut, and it's on that basis that US prosecutors have filed charges in an American court and that the extraditions have taken place. The US government also alleges that classified details of the movements of its Fifth Fleet and the ship's vulnerabilities to RPG attack were sent to the website and held by the men. Babar Ahmed was severely beaten by police during his initial arrest in London in 2003. They later admitted in court that they'd subjected him to grave abuse tantamount to torture. 
Despite this experience, both he and Talha Ahsan argue they should have faced trial here in the UK, where most of the evidence was gathered and where their crimes allegedly took place. All these things could have been dealt with six years ago or eight years ago in Barber's case and put in a British court of law. As a matter of fairness, logic and common sense, they should have been put in the British court of law. When we go home and look at our Google, our Hotmail, our Twitter, these are all on US servers, most .com, .net things that are on US servers. Most emails in the world pass through a US server. So if a US server is enough to claim extraterritorial jurisdiction, then the United States effectively has extraterritorial jurisdiction over the entire world. If they've done anything wrong, try them in the UK, show some evidence. But that was made impossible as British prosecutors weren't even allowed to see most of the evidence and what they were shown didn't amount to a case because London's Metropolitan Police bypassed them and handed over the entire file to US authorities. Further muddying the water and polarising public opinion, both the government and the corporate media have repeatedly confused the cases of Babar Ahmed and Talha Ahsan with other suspects who stand accused of more serious crimes. Some newspapers have championed the cases of Gary McKinnon and university student Richard O'Dwyer, who the US authorities also want to extradite over allegations of providing links to copyrighted content, while at the same time the newspapers have described the two Muslim men from South London as unwanted guests. The contrast has led many within Britain's Muslim community to feel that in the eyes of the establishment and media, some British citizens are more equal than others. The Muslim community have been accused of terrorist offences. Prior to that, we've had the Irish community. So other communities have been through this before. Japanese Americans were interned in the United States. Many of the Black Panther movement were falsely framed and jailed for decades. So it's happened to other communities before. And at present, with the horrors of 9-11 and 7-7, which my brother would fully condemn, we should always remember that sometimes prosecutors can get things wrong. Sometimes intelligence can be bad. Babar Ahmed and Talha Ahsan have pleaded not guilty in front of a US judge in Connecticut and are coming to terms with a judicial and prison system in many ways alien to Britain. If convicted, or if they enter into a plea bargain, they are likely to face solitary confinement in a supermax prison for years on end. Who will pay the price? for the scars that they carry for the rest of their lives. Moazam Beg, a former Guantanamo Bay detainee who was released without charge from US custody after nearly three years imprisonment, fears for their mental well-being. They will now be sent and held in solitary confinement um, for the foreseeable future in places that have been regarded and described by the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture as torture because of 23 hours of solitary confinement. Uh, I dread it. I would have dreaded to have been sent to a US prison. And I dread for them what they're going to do now with them. Uh, and that's despite knowing um, that their ordeal has come to an end here, but it's about to begin over there. Supporters of the two men also fear they may be pressured into accepting a plea bargain. David Birmingham, one of the NatWest Three, has been through the extradition process. He says he was forced into pleading guilty and having served his sentence has now recanted his guilty plea. They've never been anywhere near America. They may or may not be bad men. I have visited Bab Ahmed in prison on more than one occasion. I used to be in the army. I have no truck with terrorists and I have told him that. And if he is tried by a jury of his peers in this country and found guilty of terrorist offences, I would be the first to throw away the key. But he deserves a fair trial. And he deserves a trial where he is able to present a defence to those allegations. And if he is sent to the United States of America, he ain't getting it. Babar Ahmed maintains that he supports the concept of extradition, but only for fugitives from justice. He claims he's won the moral victory by exposing what he calls the fallacy of the UK's extradition arrangements. And while Talha Ahsan is in pre-trial detention in the US, his presence is still being felt in London, where his award-winning poetry is currently on display in the capital's South Bank Arts Centre, within sight of Parliament.
The cry of the joint campaign run by the families of Gary McKinnon, Talha Ahsan, Babur Ahmed and Richard O'Dwyer has been British justice for British citizens when the crime has allegedly been committed in Britain. The government says it's changing the law so that can happen in the future. But it comes just two weeks too late, perhaps deliberately so, for the two Muslim men from South London. Hassan Ghani for The Real News. London.